Our solar system is one of over 500 known solar systems in the entire Milky Way galaxy. The solar system came into being about 4.5 billion years ago. Hi, you're on a rock, floating in space. Pretty cool, huh? See, most of it's water. I can't even get from here to there without buying a boat. It's sad. I'm sad. I miss you. How did this happen? A long time ago. Forget this. I want to be something. Go somewhere. Do something. I want things to change. I want to invent time and space. And that's exactly where it started. Oh, I paused it. I think there's a universe now. What's it made of? Quarks and stuff. Ah, that's a thing. In a place. Don't like it? Try a new place. At a different time. Try to stick together because the world is going to get bigger and emptier. But it's not empty yet. It's still very full and about a jillion degrees. Great news. The quarks are now happily married in groups of three called a proton or a neutron. And there's something else flying around too that wants to join in but can't because it's still too- Great news. The protons and neutrons are now happily married to each other. Great news, the electrons have now joined in. Congratulations, the world is now a bunch of gas in space. But it's getting closer together. And it's getting closer together. And it's getting closer together. It's a star. So now stars have cool stuff around them, like rocks, ice, and funny clouds, which can make some very interesting things. Like this ball of flaming rocks, for example. Weather update, it's raining rocks from outer space. Weather update, those rocks might have had water inside them and now there's hot steam in the sky. Weather update, cooler temperatures today and the floor is no longer lava. Weather update, it's raining. Severe flooding alert, the entire world is now an ocean. Volcano alert. That's land. The solar system is located in the Milky Way's Orion star cluster. Only 15% of stars in the galaxy host planetary systems, and one of those stars is our own sun. Revolving around the Sun are eight planets. The planets are divided into two categories based on their composition, terrestrial and Jovian. Terrestrial planets, including Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, are primarily made of rocky material. Their surfaces are solid, they don't have ring systems, they have very few or no moons, and they are relatively small. The smallest and closest to the Sun is Mercury, which has the shortest orbit in the solar system at about three Earth months. Gravity is what keeps your feet firmly planted on the ground. That's why the average person can only jump about one and a half feet straight up. But if we had to live on another planet, say Venus or Saturn, 
let's find out what difficulties we'd have to endure there. We'll try Mercury first as it's closest to the Sun. The gravity on this planet is less than half that on Earth, so you'll be able to jump about 4 feet high. That is, if you can stand the temperatures. On the sunny side, the heat reaches 800 degrees. To be there is like standing neck deep in dark red lava on the slopes of a volcano. Oh boy! Night won't bring much respite either. Scorching air will quickly chill to minus 280 degrees. You'll also have to be patient, since one day on Mercury lasts 176 Earth days. Venus is the hottest planet, with temperatures of up to 867 degrees Fahrenheit due to an atmosphere of carbon dioxide and extensive lava flows. Venus. You'd be able to see Earth from here if not for the whirling mass of clouds above. They create a monstrous greenhouse effect, as well as immense atmospheric pressure. If you were to jump here, you'd make it just shy of 1.7 feet high, because the mass and size of Earth and Venus are almost similar with Venus being a little smaller. Besides the constant temperature of a blazing furnace, rain here wouldn't bring relief. The clouds up there are made of sulfuric acid. Next to this world of fire is a world of water, Earth. The water systems on this planet help create the only known environment in the universe capable of sustaining life. Skipping our home planet, we go straight for its moon, Luna as it's otherwise called. Gravity here is less than a fifth of that on Earth, so if you jump, you'll rise almost 9 feet in the air and won't touch the ground again for several seconds. It's hard to believe this desolate piece of space rock makes tides on Earth habit. And if you stay on the moon long enough, as in a couple million years, you'll see how much further it's gone from our home planet. The last of the terrestrial planets, Mars, might have also supported life about 3.7 billion years ago when the planet had a watery surface and moist atmosphere. Next destination is Mars, the red planet. Here, a vertical jump will take you about 4 feet in the air, if there was any air to speak of, of course. Mars has an atmosphere, but it's much thinner than on Earth. If you stay here until evening, you'll be able to marvel at a beautiful blue sunset. And you can probably see a mountain from here. That's Olympus Mons, the tallest mountain in the solar system. It's almost three times taller than Everest. And it's also a volcano, by the way. Beyond the four terrestrial planets of the inner solar system lie the Jovian planets of the outer solar system. The Jovian planets include gas giants Jupiter and Saturn and ice giants Uranus and Neptune. The gas giants are predominantly made of helium and hydrogen, and the ice giants also contain rock, ice, and a liquid mixture of water, methane, and ammonia. All four Jovian planets have multiple moons, sport ring systems, have no solid surface, and are immense. The largest Jovian is also the largest planet in the solar system. Jupiter. Fast forward to the next waypoint, Jupiter. Being a gas giant, this planet has no solid surface, so jumping here is irrelevant. But if you must, you could only hop about 6 inches high. Jupiter is more than 10 times larger than Earth and 300 times as massive, so its gravity is enormous. There's also a perpetual storm on its surface that's been there for at least 4 centuries. Although it's getting smaller with time, at the moment, our whole planet could fit into that storm. Nearby is Saturn, the solar system's second largest planet. Its signature rings are wide enough to fit between Earth and the Moon, but are barely a kilometer thick. Next, we go to Saturn, the second gas giant of the solar system. It's only slightly smaller than Jupiter, able to fit nine and a half moons in it, but way less massive. If it had any hard surface to jump from, you'd be able to hop as high as 1.4 feet in the air, almost as high as on our planet. Saturn is most famous for its rings, which are particles of dust and ice left from impacts with different space objects. It spins so fast around its axis that it has flattened itself almost into an oblong shape. It also has 62 moons, only five fewer than Jupiter. Past Saturn are the ice giants Uranus and Neptune. The slightly bigger of these ice giants, Uranus, is famous for rotating on its side. Next on our path is Uranus, another giant, only this one is made of ice. In fact, it's mostly similar to Jupiter and Saturn, 
but it has much more ice in its atmosphere and mantle. Jumping here will take you up about 1.7 feet. Uranus is also the lowest minimum temperature of all planets in the system, at minus 377 degrees. It's colder than liquid nitrogen, so you'll freeze right where you stand. Cool. Really. Next to Uranus is Neptune, the outermost planet in the solar system and also one of the coldest. Our route continues with Neptune, the twin brother of Uranus. It's also an ice giant and although a bit smaller in size, it's much more massive. Because of this mass, the gravity here is also impressive. You'd only be able to jump about 1.3 feet. One year on Neptune takes almost 165 Earth years because it's 30 times further from the Sun than we are. In fact, this is the last proved planet of the solar system. Orbiting the terrestrial planets is the asteroid belt, a flat disk of rocky objects full of remnants from the solar system's formation, from microscopic dust particles to the largest known object, the dwarf planet Ceres. Another disk of space debris lies much further out and orbits the Jovian planets, the icy Kuiper belt. Apart from asteroids, the Kuiper Belt is also home to dwarf planets such as Pluto and is the birthplace of many comets. Next is the dark and lonely Pluto, formerly the ninth planet, but now no more than a dwarf planet. Its gravity is somewhat lower than that of Triton's, and you could jump over 25 feet high here. Pluto is too small to be a fully-fledged planet. It's smaller than many moons, including ours. Its atmosphere appears and disappears at times. When Pluto is closer to the Sun, the ice on its surface evaporates to become the atmosphere. But as soon as it travels further, the gas layer goes away. So hold your breath. Beyond the Kuiper Belt is the Oort Cloud, a vast spherical collection of icy debris. It is considered the edge of the solar system since that is where the gravitational and physical influences of the Sun end. Have you ever imagined what it would be like to look down on our planet all the way from space? Well, now it's possible thanks to the amazing history of spaceflight. Our journey to space really started with a Russian scientist called Konstantin Tsiolkovsky. In 1903, he published Exploration of Outer Space by Means of Rocket Devices, where he talked about the speeds and technology you'd need to get into space. During World War II, the Russians, Americans, and Germans were trying to build missiles that could reach their enemies around the world. But after the fighting finished and they stopped trying to blow each other up, they realized that they could use these missiles as a way to reach space instead. But the most important thing for spaceflight was the Cold War. The Russians and Americans weren't fighting exactly, but they were extremely competitive, especially around technology. They didn't care that much about space, they just wanted to win. We call this the space race. The Russians led the race for a long time. They put up the first satellite, named Sputnik, and the first animal in orbit was a dog named Laika. Soon it was the big one, the first man in space. Yuri Gagarin went all the way to space and back in just 108 minutes. That's about enough time to watch a movie. The Americans realized there was only one big first left to achieve. They had to get to the moon before the Russians. And they did, when Neil Armstrong jumped out of Apollo 11 and bounced on the big gray rock in 1969. Two, one, zero, all engines running. Uh, I believe it's Charlie. Get ready, 
Since then, we've been trying to reach further and further into space. We have probes that are going to travel towards the nearest star. They'll send us back photos of the planets in our solar system, and they carry a welcome message to any aliens who find it. No cookies though, sorry aliens. Right now, the most important thing in our space is the International Space Station. It has been occupied for over 16 years, not by the same people though, that might get a little bit boring. It's used for a wide range of scientific research, especially in the battle against climate change. And what about the future? We already have a robot on Mars, but how about people? Will we walk on other planets and visit other stars? Will we find out that Justin Bieber is secretly an alien? We'll have to wait and see. Hi, Chris Hadfield here aboard the International Space Station. We keep busy on board the space station. Long days, lots of work, physical exercise. At the end of it, you're tired. But how do you sleep in space? In order to make it comfortable for the astronauts, originally, they were going to put us all in one habitation module with sleep stations all around it. But the way a station was eventually built, we have sleep stations inside Node 2, which is in the forward part of the station, and inside the service module, which is in the aft. A total of six small bedrooms, sleep stations, or sleep pods. And inside each one is just a sleeping bag tied to the wall. You might think it's uncomfortable not having a mattress and a pillow, but without gravity, of course, you don't need anything to hold you up. You can just completely relax. And you don't even need a pillow. In space, you don't even have to hold your head up. So you can relax every muscle in your body and your arms float up in front of you, your head tips forward. But before I go to sleep, I gotta put on my pajamas because I have space jammies. I'll be right back. Great. I'm in my super comfy Russian full-length pajamas. Nice for when you have to get up in the middle of the night and uh, ready to go to bed. I'll show you where I sleep. my sleep station, my sleep pod. This is uh, where I spend up to eight hours every day here on board the space station. It's actually on the floor, but uh, once you're inside, you just can't tell. Let's talk about space food. In the early days of space exploration, food was mostly squeezed out of tubes and brought up in dehydrated packets. But today, we can have quite a variety of food. There's all sorts of things that we'd normally consume on Earth that we have here in space. We just need some minor adaptations. In the case of uh, sandwiches, we had to substitute for bread. So we decided to use tortillas, but why? Mostly it's because bread, of course, makes crumbs. When you eat them on Earth, the crumbs fall down to the ground. But here, crumbs are just going to float away. On the other hand, the tortillas that we use are heat-treated and specially packaged in an oxygen-free environment to prevent mold from growing. 
they're packed in packages like this. And thanks to that process, a tortilla like this can be good for 18 months. So what we're going to do is we're going to open up our tortilla, we're going to get our peanut butter, squirt it onto the tortilla, get our honey, squirt that on there, and we will have a peanut butter honey sandwich in space. Open up the tortilla, and voila! A weightless tortilla. Okay, we got one tortilla. Whoa! Got away! Take my uh, peanut butter, open it up. Hmm, can't rip it. Fortunately, we have space scissors. They're attached via tether so they don't go floating up. Take the scissors, cut open the peanut butter pouch. Peanut butter's open, squeeze it onto the tortilla, carefully. And now, a little honey. Hey, I noticed something cool about the honey. Instead of the bubble sitting up at the top, because there's no gravity to make it float up, the bubble is floating in the middle. Okay, all closed up, and the envelope of peanut butter and honey is ready to eat. Hmm, not too bad. Last piece of my sandwich. It's been pretty delicious, but well, my hands are all sticky. Got to clean up. We don't have a sink. We don't have running water. Got to wash yourself up some other way. Disinfectant wipes. All cleaned up. Nice and hygienic on the space station. This goes in the trash. Lunch is over. And the question is, if you get a cloth dripping wet without gravity and you wring it out, what's going to happen? What will happen to a wrung out cloth? So here's my washcloth, like a magic trick. And now I'm going to get this soaking wet, and then we're going to see what will happen when we wring it out. Meredith and Kendra suggested that I dip this in a bag, but bags don't hold water in space, so instead I filled a water bag. This has drinking water in it. And I'm going to uh, squirt a bunch of water into this washcloth. Okay, so here's a soaking wet washcloth. Get the microphone so you can hear me while I'm talking. And now let's, let's start wringing it out. It's really wet. tube of water. The water is all over my hands, in fact. It rings out of the cloth into my hands. And if I let go of the cloth carefully, the water sort of has it stick to my hand. Can you cry in space? Do tears work? Well, let's try it out. I can't cry on command, but I'm going to take some water, drinking water, Put it in my eye just as if I was crying. Let's see what happens. Get myself nice and stable for you here. Here we go. So, just as if I started crying, my eye is full of tears. But you can see it just forms a ball on my eye. In fact, I can put more water in. And so if you keep crying, you just end up with a bigger and bigger ball of water in your eye until eventually it crosses across your nose and gets into your other eye or evaporates or maybe spreads over your cheek or you grab a towel and dry it up. So yes, I've gotten things in my eye. Your eyes will definitely cry in space, but the big difference is tears don't fall. For as long as humans have existed, one specific mystery has inspired more curiosity than all others. Are we alone in the universe? Or is there alien life in outer space? Let's find out on today's episode of... Colossal Question! Okay guys, let's start with something you might not be expecting. There's actually a pretty good chance that aliens do exist! Space is so enormously huge that the chance of there being intelligent life somewhere in outer space is pretty good. 
That's because there's billions and billions of planets in our galaxy alone. And some of those are considered Earth-like by NASA because they have a lot of the same conditions as Earth. Scientists have been searching for Earth-like planets that can support life, and they're finding some pretty cool stuff. In 2015, a NASA mission found the first planet that might be a candidate for supporting life, the terribly named planet Kepler-452b, which they're calling Earth 2.0, is about the same size as Earth and is the right distance from its sun to support intelligent life. It likely even has a rocky surface that could support water and plants. And Earth 2.0 isn't the only candidate for alien life. As recently as February 2017, NASA discovered seven more Earth-like planets while searching through space. Okay, so there's a planet out there that's really similar to Earth, but what does that have to do with aliens? To understand that, you need to know the basic ingredients that create life on Earth. Water, basic elements like carbon or nitrogen, and an energy source like the sun. It doesn't matter if you're talking about a microscopic bug or a big blue whale, all life on Earth is created using these same general ingredients. That's why scientists have focused on planets that are Earth-like. If all the ingredients that we know can create life are there, then maybe, just maybe, they'll find aliens. So have we found alien life yet? No, we haven't. But space is a really, really, really big place, and our instruments for searching the galaxy are pretty limited today. So it's likely that aliens exist somewhere in space. It's just gonna take lots of searching to find them. And that won't stop us from trying. Maybe the coolest attempt so far happened in 1977, when NASA launched a space probe called Voyager 1. The probe was launched carrying a golden record for an alien civilization to find and listen to. The hope is that if the Voyager spacecraft is ever discovered by an alien race, it'll be a great way for them to learn about us and find where we live. It contains greetings in 55 languages. Earth sounds like volcanoes, wind, rain, frogs, elephants, a heartbeat, Morse code, a train, a tractor, and even a kiss. It also contains pieces of traditional music from different cultures, recordings of brainwaves, 116 pictures detailing human life, and even directions back to Earth. Every day Voyager 1 floats further away from Earth, and the golden record on board should stay in playable condition for over a billion years. In the 40 years since Voyager 1 was launched, it has traveled more than 11 trillion miles through space, which is nothing compared to how big the galaxy is. So if there are aliens flying through space, let's just hope they happen to pass by our little puttering probe and come say hi.